Hello everyone, this is Grandmaster Josh Friedel, and this is another addition to my autopsy series. So again, um, just to kind of recap, basically for this series, I'm going over games from the point of view of the losing side uh, and discovering what led to their loss. So again, it doesn't necessarily have to be game losing mistakes, but it's more like what kind of mistakes really like led us astray and made it so that we uh, ended up losing the game. So I wanted to do another video for the upcoming World Championship. The last one I did from Fabiano's point of view, where he lost to Magnus in a complex game. So I figured I would choose a loss of Magnus's. Uh, and again, I mean, the, the basic idea is like, what are these guys going to be thinking and preparing during the match? So I'm not going to pretend that <laughs> I have really a, a firm clue as to the extent of what they're doing. I mean, I'm sure they're doing a lot of complex stuff, a lot of opening work, but for sure they've both taken a look at their games in previous meetings and discovered, okay, how did I beat this guy and how did I lose to this guy? So for the purpose of my series, I'm going to be going over the game again from Magnus's point of view and discover, okay, how did I lose and how can I avoid doing this throughout the match? Uh, and again, I mean, each game has its own thing. You could lose games because of blunders, and those are things that are hard to prepare for. But I think almost all losses will have at least some aspect that we can learn from and really figure out, okay, this is something I want to avoid. Um, so this was a game from Stavanger, Norway in 2015, uh, Norway Chess. And again, for some reason, it was a weird tournament because Magnus, even though it was in his home country, actually didn't perform there well there uh, for many years. So... In any case, um, so Fabiano opens with e4. So we actually have another Lopez. The previous game was also a Lopez, where if you uh, didn't check out my last video, you should definitely um, do that as well, where basically in that video, um, Fabiano actually got an advantage uh, from the opening, a very large advantage, but he played a little bit too timidly. Um, and for some moves, Magnus made the game complicated, and he was able to overtake him very quickly. Um, so this game was a, a little bit different. It was a bit more straightforward, um, but not to spoil the party too early. But anyway, uh, it was a Lopez, this time a Berlin. I would say compared to the Archangel, which was the previous game, the Berlin is a much more is much more likely to be a feature in the match. And I can hear already the groans that, oh my goodness, the Berlin is coming and it's going to be boring. And quite often Berlins can be a little bit boring. There's no doubt about it, especially the trends now where white plays rookie one and you get a very symmetrical position. Uh, but in my view, actually, the mainline Berlin has lots of unexplored territory and a lot of room for creativity. It just doesn't end up there all the time. And even those games can end sometimes with dry uh, draws. Uh, nevertheless, it's an objectively tough opening. And I think for that reason alone, it's very likely to see it in match play. Uh, but I'm interested to see what kind of ideas that both sides are going to have. So Fabiano Castle, knight takes e4, d4, knight d6, takes, 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 knight f5. So we're in familiar territory. h3, this is kind of the, the trend. It was the trend at the time. It was relatively new, this h3 move. Almost everyone and their mother played knight c3 here, which was seen as more flexible and blah, blah, blah. But h3 actually became a, a serious move with the idea that now g4 early is already kind of in the air. Uh, and then nowadays people play a lot of h5, king e8, bishop e7, and the lines go like this. You can also play with bishop d7 here um, and then try to play with king c8. There, there, are, there are quite a few ways to play. But basically, uh, this is kind of where the theory is. And at the moment, black's just doing okay. It's hard to really prove anything uh, in these lines. But one of the things which I like about Magnus's play, and which I think that you'll probably see at least some of in the match, but maybe a little bit less so, is that he likes to get the game out, out of really straight known waters early. Um, and it's what he does here. Now, again, in a match play, you'll find that people are, because people have so much time and are very well prepared, they'll play down main lines a little bit more often. Uh, even a player who doesn't normally play, you know, straight up theory as much. Uh, but Magnus, I still think, will want to at least get Fabiato out of his comfort zone. Um, a little bit, which is why he will probably mix up the opening a, a little bit. Uh, so he plays h6, which by no means is an adventurous move, but it's not quite as 
straight laced as like h5 king e8 and those lines are very concrete and um they they kind of lead to again i mean probably drawish positions but okay in any case uh rook d1 check king e8 um this is a common move you'll see just to force black's hand because trying to play bishop d7 here would result in disaster as you guys have probably seen before you can actually play knight d6 it's not like it's completely unplayable but okay i mean you have to th this kind of thing actually is not so bad right because then you take the rook you take back but it's just very passive and even if i just play a move like knight c3 it's it's usually considered uh rather unpleasant um not to mention you can try playing c4 or trying to take advantage of this pin, but almost never is this actually allowed. Um, so people almost always will respond to the check with king e8, knight to c3, knight to e7, a very common Berlin maneuver. Again, I, I would say you see this less often now because people are playing with h5, but this used to be just completely standard. b3, and then bishop f5. So I, I faced this line myself. It's, it's actually kind of a slightly odd sideline. It's the kind of line that Magnus actually likes to play, in my view, because it's it, it's a little risky, but not crazy risky or anything like that, but it kind of is a way to mix up the game early. And he actually likes to do this kind of thing, where he kind of plays lines which are not as, not quite as well known, but are still, you know, and, and kind of introduce an element of trickiness to his play. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to say that it's a bad move uh, against Fabiano, even though it didn't work in this game, but... Um, but okay, uh, Fabiano is well prepared. He played knight d4, bishop b2, rook d8. It's all fairly standard, knight c2. And here he plays knight d5. c4, and then knight f4. So here already the game is getting pretty heated because like black has this knight on b4, which... Could be annoying, but it could also just get shooed back. Uh, white has very direct ideas with e6. They don't quite lead anywhere just yet. Usually you can respond to e6, sometimes by ignoring, sometimes by playing f6. But it, they're not quite working yet, but at the same time they're in the air. And, and white also has a very strong idea, which you'll see in the game of g4 and at f5. So you get a position like this. And, and again, I, I would say this is fairly typical where Magnus plays a line where Kind of messes around with the bishop he, he makes the game a little bit double-edged but the key here is that you have to know exactly what you're doing as black to really um get a position where you're not suffering essentially <laughs> and it's in these positions i think that he can have some problems because the problem here is that you know th there are more straight laced ways to play but they often will lead to a position where you're probably just a little bit worse. So let me give you an example. Rook G8 was played in the game, which I think is actually a reasonable move. I mean, you're you're essentially... It looks like a very weird move in any normal opening, but in the Berlin, this is actually a very typical move. You make sure this pawn is guarded. Um, there are times when, you know, a knight will hop into F5, for example, and then this pawn will be defended, and you'll kind of see how that works, because white plays G4, so the, clearly the idea is to play knight F5, right? So now, because this pawn is defended, this bishop can move. And here, Magnus faced, in my view, a very, very tough choice. He chose uh, a move which I don't like very much, but at the same time, it's a very understandable one. Uh, so in this position, bishop e7 is maybe an interesting move, with the idea that knight f5, bishop g5, you're kind of getting a little bit of counterplay. But after knight e2, it still doesn't look so easy to me because you have to deal with f4. Playing a move like g6, a computer might be okay doing it, but for a human being, that's not exactly all that warm and fuzzy. So this is possible, maybe better than what he did, but very difficult to play. I think that what he should have chosen was the move... Oops, knight a6 is what he played, was the move knight c2. But again, this is a type of move which I can tell you that Magnus does not like to play. And let me explain why. Almost, oh, you know, okay, for sure white's going to take this. You take on d1, take here, bishop goes back. So you have this position where, okay, white can try to play king g2, for example, slowly expand on the king side. Black 
really has to be very cautious. It's very difficult to actually break down Black's position. It's very solid, but to ever try to win this position will be nearly impossible for Black. You're basically playing a two-sided position. And what I've found for Magnus' play is that he's, in general, a very ambitious dude, which definitely is not a strike against him. I think this is, in a lot of ways, a strength. He can actually try to win equal positions extremely well. Like, you'll notice a lot of people who go to draws, and he'll actually push to win. Uh, there are games which he can turn around where he's a bit worse. He turns it around, and he's actually able to win. But one of the drawbacks of this is that there are times when he wants to make sure the position stays slightly double-edged, and when in fact he should really buckle down and probably just accept the worst position where he's su going to suffer and probably, you know, but he's playing for a draw, but the draw is not an unlikely result here, I think. Uh, yes, white should be better. Again, after slowish moves like king up, f3, knight moves, maybe start pushing. But at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not a clear-cut win or anything like this. Like, it's just a position where he's a bit worse. But again, the draw, I think, is a very likely result here. Uh, however, because it's such a one-sided position, he didn't really like it, and he wanted to keep more pieces on the board, he wanted to keep the game interesting, which again, it, it's, not, it's, it's a very understandable thing, and I think most players have this to an extent, but unfortunately, he chooses a move and an idea which I think is just objectively not, not suited. So he plays knight a6, which again looks logical when you consider, okay, knight c2 is not working, I want to try to improve my knight. But the fact is that this takes two moves. So knight f5 happens, knight c5. And this was a position where at first I thought Fabiano's move was almost ridiculous. Ridiculous is the wrong word. Like, that it could not be best. Because I was looking at this position, if I were white here, for sure I would probably think about moves like king g2. You know, just improve my pieces and ask black what they're doing. I don't see any useful move for black. Um, again, moves like g6 are maybe possible for a computer, for a human being, there's no way. Takes an f5 and g6, very, very risky looking. You can play something like rook d7 and then move the king, which is what I'd expect. So say something like king g2, rook d7, but now you could even take this rook, and at the very least, you've probably gained time uh, over what Fabiano did, and I'll show you what he did. He took on d8 immediately and checked and played bishop a3. So to me, this is really indicative of Fabiano's style, which is that he, if he has a forcing line he likes, he's going to go for it. Uh, he's, uh, again, I'd say a very concrete player, meaning that, again, my, my temptation would be just to play King G2 and improve my position and ask Black what they're doing. But he thinks that, you know, okay, if I have a good line, I'm just going to play it. I don't care if, you know, maybe it looks a little weird that I end up losing a tempo. I, I think this is just good for me. And in this case, I think he's absolutely correct. Uh, and I certainly underestimated it myself when I was looking over this game. Because the fact is that now he's played a lot of forcing moves. Black didn't really have much choice. Moving back to e8 made no sense. Because um, he wants at least some day to be able to get his pieces out. Uh, at least that's the dream. But in this position, he has some real problems to solve. And it's, it's not such an easy thing to do. Um, and again, this is really playing into Fabiano's strengths as well, because he's able to play very direct, very concrete moves and, and create problems. Uh, that's not to say that Fabiano can't play subtle chess. I mean, he, he does it a lot, but it's more that this is the kind of chess he's very comfortable playing. And to be honest, I think anyone would like to be white here because it's just an unpleasant position. And Magnus has a way of solving problems in positions like this a lot, but I think in particular against Fabiano, he's going to find it very difficult to do because of Fabiano's precision in, in these kind of situations. But here I think it's just things kind of collapse for him very quickly. So he plays the move knight e6, which is an understandable move. Uh, but again, I think it, it a little bit stems from the same thing. In my opinion, okay, you could play the move g6, but as I've pointed out, this is really an unfortunate kind of move to play. And here, white has a concrete line, which is very nice. You can play bishop takes c5, g takes f5, bishop takes f8, rook takes f8. And then white has the superb move, knight h5. And the idea is that once this knight lands on f6, you're just going to be in a world of hurt. Um, my plan is very simple. If you take this pawn, for example, I put park my knight here. You can play rook bishop c2. I don't think it matters too much. I just attack you. Um, you can go back to f5. You can even go to b1. I'm not going to trap your bishop, most likely. But okay, I take back. And then my idea is very simple. I play f4, advance my king. And because your rook is essentially out of play, 
you're going to find it very, very difficult to, to really ever do anything. Maybe you can try Rook D8, but sometimes trading the Rooks is actually, here it's actually not a bad idea because the, these pawns are quite weak. But in some positions, trading the Rooks is actually quite bad because essentially you're, you can be almost down a pawn on the queen side, whereas on the king side, eventually white rolls. Um, in this particular position, again, I think Rook D8 maybe is, is, is quite playable. But... Um, and then even white has rook b2 as a move, because this bishop doesn't have that many squares. Uh, but basically the problem is that this king comes up, the pawns move up, you just are very passive, and it's it's quite a bit of a depressing situation. In this position, he also had the possibility, which probably he should do, if bishop takes f5. So okay, white would recapture almost for sure, g6. Probably, you know, taking on g6 I think is not super clear. Uh, you have even 96 moves might be possible there. Um, but, okay, f6 I think is is a, is a pretty normal move. And okay, white, black would probably play here, knight e6. And okay, is this position fun for black? Not really. <laughs> I mean, you've allowed white to kind of wedge into your position. There's still the clear idea of just taking the bishop and Coming up, White can also avoid the bishop trade, which might make some sense because this bishop at the moment at least is a little bit poor and you might get different ideas. Um, but at the same time, you leave White with this decision, you, you also create a situation where, okay, it's not so easy. Like White has to really earn their breakthrough. But once again, and again, I, I can't say for sure that this was into his thought process because ultimately when you're dealing with players as strong as these guys are, I mean, they're, they're really, you know, they're fighting to find the best moves and you know, biases and attitudes, I don't think, play a role into most of their decisions. But, you know, for any human being, and I believe Carlson still qualifies, there's going to be decisions where they are biased a little bit. And I'd say if he had a bias here, it would be that, again, he wanted a position where he felt there were some double-edged chances. You know, he wants a position where he feels he can play, he can make threats, he can at least do stuff. And sometimes, however, I think he chooses that at the detriment of his position a little bit. Like here, I think, okay, this position is very one-sided, but at the same time, he can still play this on. This is not by any means dead lost. He played the move 96, which is quite logical. And again, of course, all this is assuming that they're calculating accurately. There, it's very possible to have missed something in his calculations. And I think in this position, in fact, it's quite likely uh, because it is very tactical how this gets punished. Um, but again, we, we, this goes into the matchup a little bit where I think this is where Fabiano really shines. I don't want to say he's a better calculator than Magnus just because calculation is such a broad term. Like calculation involves not only calculating tempo moves accurately, calculating the variations, but also evaluating. And I think at evaluating objectively, for the most part, Carlson is extremely good. Um, but I would also say that Fabiano is extremely objective with how he evaluates and it's one of his strengths as a player as well so you get to this position and really it's about calculating it accurately and i think fabiano did a better job uh, and ultimately that could have been what decided this more than any kind of biases that i was talking about um but this position really does show uh, the good side of fabiano because he took knight takes g7 bishop f8 and i'm guessing this is what Magnus was relying on, because at first it looks like a real problem for White, because if you move the knight, you take this guy and your pin. But he had it covered with the move e6. And the problem is that you can't really take anything uh, too successfully. He took the knight on f5, which, uh, def which is really the only move. But uh, the point is, if you try to take something else, then it just doesn't really work out for you too well. I mean, if you try to take this knight with the bishop, there's knight check. If you try to take with the rook, f e7 is extremely nasty. Um, because if takes, of course, I just made you. And lastly, if f takes e6, you simply play knight takes e6. And the problem is that I'm threatening mate on d8. So taking on f5 will just run into mate in one, which definitely ruins your fun. Uh, so in any case, this is just dead lost. So he took on f5, which would be logical, and then took e6, knight moved back. So of course, um, he ended up winning a pawn back out of all this, so he's still even material. But this is where evaluation comes in, and I have no doubt that, for the, I'm almost sure that both sides were evaluating this accurately, as in the position is miserable for black. 
Uh, there's no way Carlson aimed for this. Uh, but the main idea is that uh, because you've changed the pawn structure, black has only a weak pawn on e6, h6 is weak, and the knight, I'd say, is clearly better than the bishop in a position like this. It can park itself on e4. All knight versus bishop endings without the rooks are just going to be lost because you, you just can't make a pass pawn over here, and I'm way too fast pushing my king side. So again, it's a situation where I think that it's not just about calculating the accurate moves, like the whole line with knight takes g7 and e6, but you have to evaluate the resulting position. And again, I think both of these players do an extremely good job as part of why they're two of the best players in the world. But I would say that when you get Fabiano in a situation where it's really about like calculating these lines accurately, finding the nuances at the end, doing all of this, he's just going to do a really great job. Um, and obviously, it's not that you know Carlson in, on purpose set up this kind of position. It was more that it's the way it happened. Uh, but definitely, this is this is a situation where a lot of players may not find the moves accurate enough to punish Carlson and win the game. But Fabiano certainly is capable. Um, but once again, I mean, it was basically a couple rough choices. First, playing knight a6, which, again, looked kind of nice to improve the knight, but just wasn't the most accurate move. He should have maybe settled for knight c2. And then this decision to not take on f5 and accept, again, a, a position which is very one-sided, but maybe he has defensive chances uh, to try to keep the game more interesting, uh, where maybe a miscalculation was involved. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but in any case, uh, they ended up here, and, and honestly, this position is pretty much lost. Um, I'm going to show you Fabiano's technique because it's excellent, but it's there's almost nothing to say because there's just too many weaknesses so here. So he plays bishop e7, and this is where taking your time really is effective because there's no way black can actually stop your plan, so you might as well play it. You know, There's no reason to allow counterplay. You just want to build your position. So rook f8 he plays, and now Fabiano finds a very nice idea with rook d3. There's no reason to try to rush pushing your f-pawn because black can't do anything about it. So one of his key ideas here is that now rook f3 to f7 can come into play. So rook f7 was played. So I thought he would probably play rook f3 here, and maybe black should play rook h7, but that's a very depressing move. Like, it would actually hurt me physically to play rook h7. I'd be like, oh... Um, but at the same time, I mean, the king and pawn endgame is just, you, you get an endgame like this and it's almost resignable sometimes. Because, okay, you can play moves like b5, right, just to give you an example, but I can just ignore you. You can play a5, but then I play a4. And again, you, you get a position like this and there's just no way for you to create a pass pawn because I just ignore you. The king can't enter because the knight, and you can take all the time in the world. You can play king e3, f4, f5 at some point, maybe just try to bring your king in if black allows it. Basically, you have all the time in the world to win, and almost never, ever is it a fortress. And I can tell you this from experience, because I've defended these positions as black, not usually this bad, but I've had Berlin endgames or exchange Lopez endings where I've allowed this, and this is kind of how you learn not to allow it, honestly. You lose some miserable games. But essentially, there's just no way you can hold that position. Um, there's no fortresses, there's always weaknesses, there's always ways your opponent can get in. It's, I'd say, 1 in 20 times maybe at most that's a fortress. Uh, and Carlson himself has said he doesn't believe in fortresses, so uh, you, you, you can know for sure he knew he was busted here. But at the same time, uh, there's not much he can do about it. He just has to hope for a, a Fabiano error, which did not come. So knight h5 was played, bishop d6, rook f3. Rook h7, so it sort of transposes. Uh, maybe maybe Magnus had a chance to move his bishop somewhere else and try rook d7, but honestly, it's it's all very bad. So rook e3 was played, and now he goes for f4. So now that the rook's tied down, he starts pushing. Bishop a3, king f3, rook d2, g5. So finally, he starts pushing. King here. I mean, allowing the connected passers would be very bad. The e-pawn is certainly not dangerous. So again, no reason to rush. He takes his time. Knight to g3. Notice how you have a position like this where you have a clear winning plan. It is very important, I'd say, for execution. Like, if you rush the plan, if you, for example, if you were to play g6 right here and then allow rook g8, obviously, maybe he's still winning after something like f5, just, just to illustrate. 
maybe he's still winning here. I mean, this is still looking really nice. But again, why bother, right? Like, this is not, you know, after takes, takes, you have to deal with check, maybe rook back. Like, there's just no reason to allow this kind of silliness. Uh, whereas the way he plays, he just takes his time. He keeps his position secure. You always have to make sure moves like e5 don't work and stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, he has the pawn coming up to h4. There's just nothing that can happen to him here. So rook h8 was played. h4, again, just taking your time. b6, h5, c5. So it looks like Magnus is doing nothing, and essentially he is, but there's nothing really much to be done here. G6. So finally, Fabiano plays G6, but notice how he plays it in a position where it's just a protected pass pawn. That he doesn't play it too early. He just, you know, takes his time. And this is really the best way to play here. Yeah. Rookie eight. So here he gets a little bit concrete. Uh, and again, I'd say for most players, the best way to play here just to move like King F3 and then F5. Just take your time. Fabiano plays F5 immediately, uh, but it's based on calculation. After takes, he doesn't take with the king. He plays the very nice move, king F4, because he wants to take with the knight. Um, and rook takes e2, e2 is possible, but then simply recapture. And king takes that pawn next. It's just game over. So, again, I mean, this isn't much, you know. But it's not anything too fancy. But basically, he, uh, you know, he, he definitely gets a little bit concrete here, but it's it's all very basic. Uh, it's just you have to make sure you calculate accurately if you ever go when you go for those slightly forcing moves. But again, this is this is almost nothing. So he plays rook h8, which is a very sad move. But okay, I mean, there's not much to be done. He felt like trading rooks was just resigning. Knight takes f5, and then the final move rook g2, and uh, Magnus decided that was it. Uh, he could have tried king e6 here, of course, but the problem is g7. And then this pin is very nasty. Notice you can't go to f7 because knight takes h6 check. So it's just game over. Uh, so again, I mean, you don't see, well, you don't see Magnus lose very often at all, but you don't see this kind of straightforward loss very often. But one of the, you know, Fabiano is one of the players who can deliver this kind of loss to him. And the reason he can is because he's capable of not just calculating deep, lines, but he's, ca he's capable of playing them very, very accurately. And notice how he had to not only calculate all that knight takes g7, e6 stuff, he had to evaluate the position afterwards well, which he was able to do. So basically, because he's in a position to be accurate enough, to calculate well enough to punish Magnus over the course of a game, uh, he's one of the players who can be a threat. So how does Magnus look at this loss? Well, first of all, I mean, okay, it was a tough loss. First of all, very high level from Fabiano. He made almost no mistakes in the whole game. So if your opponent does that, it's uh, going to be a hard day for you, let's put it that way. But one of the things I would say is that he gave him a position where, okay, it was a Berlin, it was slightly odd, but it was also a position where Fabiano could play very, very direct, aggressive chess. He does not have problems playing the kind of chess at all. So we got a position where, you know, the moves like G4, Knight F5, I mean, again, for not every player, they'd be that natural probably. But for him, again, this kind of play was very straightforward. Again, he chose this line with Rook D8, Bishop uh, Rook D1 check, Bishop A3, which to my mind wasn't natural. But for him, it was just very direct, very, um, you know, just immediately putting pressure on the opponent. And it was very effective. And, and Magnus kind of... Especially, I think, in trying a little bit too hard to maybe keep that double-edged nature to the position kind of allowed everything to slip. Um, but again, I, you know, when I do these videos, in some ways I have to speculate a little because I didn't get to chat with him <laughs> to ask him what exactly happened. So it could have been he miscalculated stuff. That's almost always the case. Uh, but I'd say if he can, you know, learn from this game, a lot of it is just going to be, okay, avoid those kind of positions where... He can just build up his position, put his pieces on aggressive squares, put pressure on me. Uh, it sounds kind of obvious, but at the same time, there are players who actually aren't so comfortable being that directly aggressive. Um, and Fabiano is definitely one of them who is. Um, but otherwise, it's really about like, you know, you give Fabiano his type of position and you make either one or two inaccuracies you can just be in huge trouble. So one of the other things I guess would be, and again, I'm really basing this on the fact that I'm assuming he did this, which is that there are certain positions where I think he he tries to keep the game double-edged maybe too much. And there was at least one situation back um, 
back here where I thought that he had to go for an IC2, simplify into a position where he doesn't have much play, but he's almost certainly okay-ish. Like, maybe a little worse, but he's he's doing all right. And the cost of keeping the game double-edged was just too great. So I would say that this is definitely something which he's going to have to watch for. And, and again, I believe in a world championship event, that's not a tournament where you're trying to get the most points possible a lot of the times. In a world championship event, you just got to beat the other guy. So I think he will play slightly more conservative, except a couple end games where maybe he's just playing to draw. Um, and no one really likes that. You know, he's not the only one who doesn't like to do that. Maybe a couple of people do. But for the most part, people do not like to do this. Uh, it's one of the things Karyakin did extremely well. Like He would accept that worst endgame, but hold it every time. That's not exactly how Magnus would like to play, but there are times when it's necessary, and he has to make sure that when it is, he he doesn't kind of get carried away. Um, because, again, when Fabiano's on his game, he has his kind of position, it does not take many errors to lose. Let me put it that way. Uh, in any case, I'm really looking forward to this match uh, quite a bit. M more than I have, you know, n nothing against Anand or Karyakin, who are <laughs> both the great players in their own right, but I would probably look forward to this match more than those two. Just, I think we could have the most interesting games. I think Fabiano's the most uncompromising of those players as far as getting double-edged positions and really put it, being able to put pressure on him because Fabiano knows he can lose to him for sure. In any case, uh, or sorry, Magnus knows he can lose to him. It's always good to say something wrong at the end of the video. <laughs> In any case, uh, I hope you enjoyed the game and enjoying the series. If you guys are interested in seeing more of these videos, definitely subscribe to my channel. There's also a link to a Patron page if you want to check out uh, polls and stuff for future videos and you can become a contributor. Um, and otherwise, I will just see you guys next time. So have a good one.